Great. Good morning, Lansdowne. Please take your seats, open your Bibles to those chapters out of Nehemiah. Building walls, restoring lives. That's the strap line of our series. And with the wonderful encouragement of 2.3 million from our recent Gift and Pledge Sunday for that new building, we continue our series from the memoirs of Nehemiah. But if you've just joined us this morning, who exactly was Nehemiah? Well, here's some basics to bring you up to speed. He was cupbearer uh, to the Persian king Artaxerxes. There he is, Charlton Heston. Um, he was a key civil servant in the imperial palace. When did he live? Around about the middle of the 5th century. And in 445, Nehemiah risked his life by going to the emperor to ask if he could be released from his duties to take up responsibility for a major building project in his native city of Jerusalem. And there he is with his safety helmet on. We read, Amanda read, from the end of chapter 6 that he only had to wear that helmet for 52 days. That's how quickly he completed the task. 52 days. Now, I am pretty sure that not even Ian Johnson and Keith Mackay will be able to deliver our building project within that time schedule. They reckon it'll be more like 547 days. That's 18 months. And all for the princely sum of three million pounds, they assure us. But actually, that's a bargain. How do I know? Well, the other day, someone in LBC, a qualified, certified engineer who shall rename, remain nameless, won't he, Chris Adams? <laughs> Chris approached me to say that he had calculated how much it would have cost Nehemiah to rebuild the city walls of Jerusalem in 445 BC. He'd taken, so he tells me, the various weights and measures he compared the prices of materials and labor between 445 BC and 2013 AD, and he reckoned that Nehemiah's project would have come in at 5.8 million. You see, it's a bargain. <laughs> Three million, a bargain. Now, why is Nehemiah important? Because of his response to tragic news. That's why Nehemiah is important. Some of his friends, you remember, came to visit him and brought a copy of the Jerusalem Chronicle with the news that the city walls were in ruins and the gates burned down. He read the Jerusalem Chronicle or some such thing. Did you read the newspapers at the beginning of this week? Similar headlines about the church were in the press this week. Let's have a look at the caption. Church on the brink of extinction. That's the comment from a speech given by the former Archbishop of Canterbury, George Carey. It's the Anglicans in particular who were the subject of this gloomy perspective. Of course, predictions of the church's demise, that's hardly news. Without the renewing work of God, the church is always one generation away from extinction. Nevertheless, the case for the terminal decline of the established church seems to get stronger every year. And church leaders like Carey are prophesying it, not just the usual cynics. And that issue matters. It really does matter what happens to our national church. Just like it mattered to Nehemiah that the name of God was being discounted because of the fortunes of God's people. It should matter to us, Lansdowne that the Judeo-Christian foundations of Britain have been systematically dismantled in the last 50, 60 years. It should matter, Lansdowne, that the great national heritage of faith has been sold for 30 pieces of political correctness. It should matter to us that churches are closing in far greater numbers than the new ones are opening. It should matter for this reason. If we want to see a renewal of Christian faith in our generation, then that may well have to happen outside the national church. The Anglican church has no more divine right to survive than any other tradition, including our own. 
We have no divine right to survive. Although that application, of course, is removed from Nehemiah's day, historically, it does not take us away from the basic message of this journal of his that speaks to us so powerfully, especially in the light of what uh, is going to happen here at LBC over the next three years. Let me put it in the form of a question. Why build a church in the 21st century when so many are closing? Why build a church? Why spend three million pounds on building a church on this site for the same reason that Nehemiah rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem in the 5th? Because God is great and his glorious name must be known. Because the good news about him must ring out from places like this and from homes and families like yours. Because a generation is growing up that does not know the name of Jesus except as a swear word. That's why we are to build a church on this site in the 21st century. And if we do not rise up and rebuild the broken walls of the Christian faith in our nation, then who will? Who will do that? The university? No, they won't do our job for us. They will build their, their towering accommodation blocks around us. Will private business invest in the church? Well, they'll be glad of an inward investment in the Lansdowne area. Will the planning department of the local council offer us a few hundred thousand pounds? I doubt it. Hopefully, they'll remain on our side. But you see, if we are not concerned about the advance of the Christian faith in our society, then no one else is going to own it financially, emotionally, and practically, we have to. So, where are we in the plot line of Nehemiah? Well, last Sunday morning, we reached, you remember, the end of chapter 2. And we came across some interesting characters called Sambalat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite. Aren't they wonderful names? Sambalat was the governor of neighboring Samaria. He and his allies, being non-Jews, were not very happy with the rebuilding project that Nehemiah had come to commence. And so we read in verse 10 of, of chapter 2. When Sambalat and Tobiah heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. And so what they do is feed the racial tensions in the city and play on the fear of the ruling Persian classes. If these Jews get their act together, they will threaten the security of the status quo. That was their basic ploy. Now, one of the big themes of chapters 3 to 6, which we're going to try and cover in one giant leap this morning, one of the big themes is this morning's title, Building with Opposition, or Building in the Context of Opposition. And that opposition in the chapters 3 to 6 comes in two forms. Firstly, externally, from outside. Time and again, we read about the external pressure of Sambalat and Tobiah, their troublemaking tactics, their smear campaigns, their use of intimidation. Here's just a flavor. Chapter 4, verse 1. When Sambalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly in, in, incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. Then verse 7 of, of, of chapter 4. But when Sambalat, uh, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the men of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and the gaps were being closed. They were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. And then at the end of our sequence in chapter 6 and verse, uh, verse 19. And Tobiah, the last phrase, and Tobiah sent letters to intimidate me. Coping with the challenge of living for God in a hostile environment can be very tough. Perhaps this morning you know that personally more than me in your work context. The anti-Christian agenda that you face tomorrow. The aggressive secularism. Or sometimes in work, in the office, the complete indifference to your faith. Maybe this morning you are the only one who loves Jesus in your family. Or on your corridor in the student campus. You're the only one who believes in Christ. The front line can be a lonely place as a Christian. 
But Nehemiah has to deal not just with uh, external opposition, but with internal opposition as well. Even the people of God come to find the re rebuilding project of Jerusalem's walls just too much. And so instead of building with bricks, they start throwing them at each other. Chapter 5 is full of that, isn't it? Listen to verse 1 again of chapter 5. Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their Jewish brothers. They said, Nehemiah, you can't eat walls. We are hungry. Friendly fire can be a source of real problems in any great work of God. And my friends of Lansdowne, I don't doubt that we will have to deal with that among ourselves over the coming years. Friendly fire as we wrestle with the uncomfortable changes involved. The sacrifices that uh, we'll have to make in order to pursue a vision that says, church isn't just here for me. Church is for those who are not yet here. That's the vision that drives this thing. And in pursuit of that vision, there will be sacrifice, there will be discomfort, there will be inconvenience. But we have to hold on to the vision before us that church isn't just about you and your needs and your agenda. It's about those who are not yet with us. It's about our mission. And so we are building vision in the midst of opposition. If you didn't already know, visions are easy to criticize. Because a vision is about the future, not the past. And that means a vision has no history. Nothing to go on. It's plenty of gaps in it, you see. Because it's about what might be. So such vision casting is often a target for critics. Because they want to know the details of the future. And the vision doesn't give you all of those details. At least not first up front. So... How did Nehemiah handle these various forms of opposition, the internal and the external? Let me give you four principles briefly, one from each of the chapters before us. Firstly, starting in chapter 3, first principle, people are the project. People are the project. Look, you see, there's, there's Nehemiah at the walls organizing a ministry fair. I really do hope you can stay just for 30 minutes if, if you haven't brought lunch or just grab a, grab a drink, grab a cup of coffee, walk through the conference hall. People have done some amazing things there to tempt you. You know, food tasting exercises and interesting little giveaways. Stay just for half an hour. Get a sense of what the walls look like here in Lansdowne in ministry and how that, how that those uh, walls are, are, are people-shaped. And, and mainly driven by volunteers. And see, as you get a sense of, of who we are, what we are, see where you can become part of a team. That's what this regeneration project is really all about. It's about people, because people are the project. Giving people a place to serve and belong and contribute, using your gifts and time to make a difference somewhere in this great adventure of faith. Look, don't imagine that we are really about the creation of some high-tech, multi-purpose, environmentally friendly facility in the next three years, made of concrete steel and Purbeck stone. I hope that some of that will be in the project, at least the steel and concrete. But you see, it's living stones that matter. It's you and me together. That's the way to turn a crowd into a community, by emphasizing that people are the project and by giving individuals a place and a space on the wall. Just see what Nehemiah does in chapter 3 of his memoirs. It's a chapter full of, of the names of those involved in fascinating places around the wall, using their skills to make a difference. Look, in verse 1, Eliashep. And the priests, they rebuild the, the sheep gate. Uh, the fish gate, in verse 3, is rebuilt by the sons of Hassanah. Goldsmiths and perfume makers make repairs to the Jishana gate and the broad wall. At verse 11 of chapter 3, 
Malchijah and his daughters repair the tower of the ovens along with the, the dung gate in verse 14. That must have been a pretty smelly place to be on the wall. Let's have a look at the map of, of, of Jerusalem in Nehemiah's day. There's all those gates and all those places along the wall. And so Nehemiah's ministry fair goes on right through the chapter, section by section of the city, wall by wall, family by family, side by side, working together towards the same goal, filling gaps, whoops, hanging doors, firing bricks, these exotic names like the tombs of David and the house of heroes. You know, go next door when we conclude in a few moments. Go, go next door. Take a drink with you. And you will see the equivalent of the sheep gate and the inspection gate and the horse gate where people are serving among us. The flower arrangers, the media team, the stewards and the security guards, the crèche supervisors and the coffee makers and the small group leaders and the caterers. And so it goes on and on around the wall. And some of those have gaps which need filling. And some simply need more people praying. One of the great uh, pictures of the New Testament church is the one described by, by Peter in his letter. His first letter, chapter 2 and verse 4. As you come to him, the living stone, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. That's what we're about. The faith which unites us to Jesus, the stone, the living stone, he who is alive, brings us by his spirit into living connection with each other. In love and service, in prayer and community. Do I need to say more? Let me change the metaphor. It is always, always harder to rock a boat which you are rowing. It really is. So pull together. Get involved. Don't wait until our lovely new building is completed in three years' time or so. It is three years away in any case. And let me say this. If you are not serving somewhere on the wall in Lansdowne right now, you are not likely to be serving on the wall in three years' time. Do you realize that? If you are not stuck in now, who's to say you'll be stuck in in three years' time? So get involved now. Join the army of volunteers now. And I say it for this reason as well. You will find church a very frustrating experience if you simply come and go through the doors into this building on a Sunday and out again. You'll find belonging to Lansdowne a very frustrating experience if you don't get yourself involved somewhere on the wall. Because there's a place for you. There really is. There are situations vacant, and there is a unique contribution that only you can make. That's the first principle, then. People are the project. Secondly, the battle belongs to God. Here we're in chapter 4. The battle belongs to God. In that chapter, chapter 4, we, we, we read about the way that the enemies of the project, Sambalat and Tobiah and the others, used derision contempt and sarcasm to undermine the morale of the workforce. Let's quote them in, 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 in verse 2 and 3 there. What are those feeble Jews doing? What they are building, even a, even a fox climbing on it would break down their wall of stones. And Nehemiah, notice in verse 4, dis, responds as he frequently does with prayer. Hear us, O God, for we are despised. You know what prayer does? Prayer always gives perspective to the battles that we are fighting. Prayer reminds us that ultimately, this is a spiritual conflict we face. As verse 9 goes on to say, But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. We prayed and we planned. You see, both together, always, in the Christian life, we pray and we plan. The battle does belong to God. But that does not mean that we are passive and inactive. We hear it again, same idea, in verse 14 of the fourth chapter. After I looked things over, 
I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your homes. So he prayed, he planned, and he remembered. He remembered God's faithfulness, the story so far. He remembered what God had put in his heart to do back there in southern Iran, in Susa, in the palace of the emperor. Of course it seemed impossible, uh, maybe to him and to them. Most divinely originated visions do seem impossible. Nehemiah's critics, they, they, they had some valid points. The people of Jerusalem didn't have the necessary experience or skills. They weren't used to this huge building project. Their morale was very low. But the critics didn't factor God into the equation. Nehemiah believed that God was with him. So he called the people to remember that. And he posted a 24-hour guard. The positioning of some people to work on the wall while others carried swords and spears and bows. It all contributes to this wonderful summary in verse 16 of chapter 4. From that day on, half of my men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears and shields and bows and armor. The officials posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried the materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his sides as he worked. And so it went on. What a remarkable description of the way that Nehemiah managed the challenge of criticism. And through that division of labor and reinforcing the weak areas in the wall and sharing responsibilities, through it all is the focus on God and his power. And the fact that the battle and therefore the ultimate victory belongs to him. Listen to verse 20. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. You see, the battle belongs to the Lord. Listen, my biggest fear in our regeneration project over the next few years is not the raising of the last 400,000 pounds. It's not. That's not my biggest fear. My biggest fear is not the delivery of a ministry and staff development plan, which will do justice to the size of our vision. My biggest fear is that we will forget where our true strength lies. That we won't remember that the battle belongs to the Lord. And that the army of God marches on its knees. That's my biggest fear. That we will rely upon ourselves and upon our financial resources and upon our energy and our reputation rather than recognizing that the battle belongs to God. Do you believe that, folks? Good. Good. Because in the battle that we are engaged in, victories are won through prayer, not in planning departments. They are won by dependence upon God's spirit, not the architect's design, as wonderful as that will be. All the quantity surveyor's calculations, as accurate as we hope they'll be. Thirdly, leaders see an opportunity, not a crisis. A crisis is certainly what chapter 5 appears to be. The nature of the crisis is the impact that this huge enterprise was having on those at the bottom of the social pile. Because those at the top were treating them unfairly. The vicious economic cycle was trapping many in, in poverty and slavery. You see, to buy food to eat, land was being sold. To pay tax to the Persian king, money was being borrowed. And the only way out of such debt for some poorer Jewish families was to sell their children to richer Jewish creditors until the debt was, was canceled. And this caused a crisis in the community. The walls were going up, but relationships were breaking down. 
were strained and social needs were being ignored. Here again, the opening of chapter 5. Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their Jewish brothers. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get grain during the famine. We have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we're of the same same flesh and blood as our countrymen, and though our sons are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. It's a pretty, a pretty major crisis. The success of the project was in danger of sacrificing the more important values of this family of faith. Folks, watch out for that. In the next few years, watch out for that. When a project or a program becomes more important than people, we are in trouble. So I want to encourage you to keep investing in the lives of the living stones next to you this morning, or in front of you, or behind you. Keep investing in those relationships, in each other. It's not the program in the end that will move us forward, it's the people. It's the living stones. Because things were out of alignment in Jerusalem. People were pulling in different directions. You know what happens to, to the tires and wheels at the front end of a car? That can happen to churches. Things can veer to one side. When we don't address people issues, when we don't deal with conflict, when we don't listen to each other, the car moves one way or the other dangerously. Our vision needs to be realigned so that everyone keeps getting it. Week in, week out, month in, month out, we restate the vision. Here in Jerusalem, people were losing sight of what it was all about. The pressures of, of, of a food shortage and, and paying the bills meant that they were losing vision. But for Nehemiah, as for all true leaders, the crisis becomes an opportunity to check the tires and the wheel balance, to realign things in order to move forward straight. Verse 6, read that. Here we go. When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. Hey, does that surprise you? A Christian leader getting worked up about something? Do you know it's sometimes right to be angry? Not, of course, when our anger arises from our insecurity or our selfishness. But when, as here, anger arises from a sense of injustice. Now, of course, with human anger, it's not always easy to work out which is which. So we need to be very careful, like Nehemiah, because he is. That little phrase in verse 7, I was angry, and then I pondered these things in my mind. The very best thing to do when you get mad is to give it time. Ponder about it. Check it out. Talk to yourself. Because then your anger can be the platform for constructive action. Which is what happens with Nehemiah. He goes first to those responsible for the wrong in private. The nobles, the wealthy landowners, the money lenders. He tells them straight what he thought. This is usury and it must stop. Then he calls a public meeting at which they agree to stop charging interest, to give back the land taken, and also to release any bond slaves. You see, the crisis becomes an opportunity to model a better, more compassionate, and just community. And that modeling begins at the top what do we say? Speed of the leader, speed of the team. Leadership models the way forward, which is what the concluding paragraphs of chapter 5 give us. Read from verse 14 with me. Moreover, from the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, until his 32nd year, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allotted to the governor, 
But the earlier governors, those preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to food and wine. Their assistants also lauded it over the people. That wasn't the model of leadership that Nehemiah was offering in Jerusalem. He learned to pass the test of prosperity. He handled well the trappings of, of success and he made sure that others did the same. He was not in Jerusalem to get, but to give. Service, not status, motivated him. Despite the increased pressure, the popularity, and the power of his office, he never lost sight of why he was there. What kept his vision clear? He mentions two things. The first, in verse 15. But out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. Out of reverence for God. Unlike all previous governors who lined their pockets at the expense of the people, out of reverence for God, respect for God and God's name, he behaved differently. The second reason why his vision was kept clear was because he had a love for people. Verse 18 makes that obvious. I never demanded the food allotted to the governor because the demands were heavy on these people. Good leaders lift others up. They empower and they serve others. They inspire them to be more than they thought they could ever be. That's leadership. There's so much that one can say about Nehemiah, the visionary leader. He, he shows us that any vision worth pursuing will demand sacrifice and risk, uncertainty and the unknown. But leaders lead best when they lead with vision. John Maxwell says it well. People buy into a leader before they buy into the vision. People buy into the vision after the leader buys into it. And the leader's greatest asset is his example. Example here in Nehemiah's life is the main thing which influences others to follow his vision as a leader. And influence is the key to getting people on board. I've got just a couple of minutes left for the final principle out of chapter 6. Here it is. The last lap is the crucial one. Leaders see an opportunity, not a crisis, and the last lap is the crucial one. According to verse 1 of chapter 6, when the whole project was virtually completed with only the doors on the main gates needed to be put in place, the enemies and the opponents of the regeneration program throw the dice one last time. They try to put Nehemiah off. They use three tactics. Distraction. They send him four letters saying, hey, let's get together. And Nehemiah says in verse 3, look, I can't. I've got too much to do. They try misinformation. They begin to circulate a rumor that undermines the credibility of Nehemiah's leadership. And then finally, he deals with intimidation. He's tricked, or they try to trick him to go to a, a, a kind of rendezvous where he can hide out in the temple because others, they say, are after his life. So with distraction and misinformation and intimidation... Nehemiah finishes the task. We read that wonderful statement in verse 15. So the wall was completed in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. That's it. Nehemiah realized that in the end... This was all completed because God was with them. Finishing well is so important. And right on the last lap, Nehemiah deals with these critical pressures of distraction, of misinformation, and of intimidation. And he stays focused and he crosses the line. And as he crosses the line, Nehemiah knows who's really won the battle. My friends, We've yet to begin, really, in our regeneration project. But as we get through the stages, remember, the last lap is the crucial one. Life is full of, of, of distraction, full of, it, full of misinformation, full of intimidation. Vision is often a casualty in those things. It gets lost among the many lights. The daily grind can be tough on vision. Because you know what it is? Life is now. Bills are now. Crisis is now. Vision is for later. 
It is easy to lose sight of the main thing. Let's not let that happen. Let's finish well. And the only way I know that we at LBC can do that is by fixing our eyes on Christ, the author and finisher of faith. For the battle belongs to him. He's won it. And he will build his church. And nothing and no one will stop him from completing that task. Let's pray. Father, help us to be those who understand that in this whole matter of building with vision, people are the project. And that the battle belongs to you. Help us to see these crises we're going to face as opportunities for proving you. And Lord, help us, each of us, to finish well, knowing that the last lap is the crucial one. Lord, what you have started among us, bring to completion. We know you'll do that as we fix our eyes upon Jesus, the one who is building his church, even in these days of decline in Western Europe and in the UK in particular. You are building your church, and we are part of that glorious vision. Lord, keep that before us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.